welcome to the Shepcast. No, welcome. we're not ready. I'm ready. We're having technical issues right now. Thank you very much. <sighs> Woof. Me, I'm the issue. Yes. <sighs> I'll just put it back where it was. It looks better there than it did where you had it otherwise. Uh, welcome to the Shepcast. <clears throat> Welcome to the Shepcast. Welcome to our continued exploration of Matthew 5 and 1 Corinthians cast. Yeah, yeah but I, with a fun little mix-up of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, one of the underused books. Uh, underused, underutilized by us. By everyone. Mm, Maybe. I'm pretty sure it gets a lot of airplay in the synagogues. Mm, what are you trying to say there? I'm trying to say that uh, if you are in the uh, in the synagogue, they do a Torah portion, and the Torah is not infinitely long. Mm. Uh, so the Torah is only the first five books of Moses. If you're doing that over the course of a year, you have to go between. Like it's like us with the Gospels, yeah, where you've got four sure. books and like you really take heavily from those. Yeah. You ever really... heard of the Beatitudes before? Exactly my point, right? Like we do those all the time. It seems like every second that there mm -hmm. is, we're doing the Beatitudes. So if you're in the synagogue and you're doing a Torah portion every week, it does not take you long to get to Deuteronomy. Mm, fair like enough. it's it's there, man. Oh, the Torah, like the first five books, they're long. They're long, but... Comparatively. But. Yeah, but you're, you're going to hit Deuteronomy eventually. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, wow. Wait, the weather's beautiful outside. It is really nice. Just a bit of banter. That's nice banter. I thought yeah. we were bantering enough about Deuteronomy, but the weather. Yeah, the weather out yeah. there. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right. <laughs> cool. Well, how about Deuteronomy then? Do let's. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways and by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear it, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and to possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord your God swore to your fa fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. That's it. Life and good. Goodbye. Bookmark. I hope that wasn't a nice fancy bookmark. It was just a torn sheet of paper. It was torn from the Lutheran Layman's League of Canada. Oh, Lutheran Layman's League of Legends. Mm. Uh, the admonition of God here, people have in mind that God will just arbitrarily punish you if you misbehave, mm. where God will be like, oh, that's, you did a bad thing. Now I'm going to kill you, which isn't really the way things go. Um, God is trying to spare you from the consequences of your own actions, usually by and large. Mm -hmm. So if you mess up hard, bad things happen to you, then you're like, how did this possibly happen to us? Right. Well, I mean, like, it's not like God punishes you with death when you commit the sin of drinking poison, if you see what I mean. Right. The, the drinking of the poison carries with it the consequence of death. Um, and you would be well advised not to drink the poison, but if you do, bad things typically tend to happen as a result of that. Right. Yeah. Well, and the poison itself, of course, has the warning on the label that says, do not drink or the you will die. The scary skull and crossbones. Exactly, right? And it's the same thing here where God is saying, do not do or else, right? Like bad things will happen. There's always that that warning, whether like as explicit as this or as explicit as the poison sign, but... There are warnings. There are things to be aware of that point you towards what the consequence is. And you should be mindful of those. And again, it's not as though it's, it doesn't work in the way that you think it does. Because when, when God says to you, choose life, it's very difficult to impress on uh, the kids these days about how important it is for you to obey the commandments of God. Because you only know that you've screwed it up after you screwed it up. Right. And then it's a little late to, to go back. Right. Uh, frequently when God tells you not to murder, not to commit adultery, not to steal, these commandments are there for your benefit, not for his. And people are like, but wait a minute, what if I want to commit adultery? Yeah, well... <clears throat> There's consequences. There are consequences to those yep. decisions that will run you aground in certain particular ways. And that's a real shame and a real problem, but what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. 
the only way to understand it is to say, maybe God has a reason for telling me to do these things that I will only understand later, right. um, and that maybe those are good things to do that will get us out of an awful lot of the problems that we're currently in. Right. And I mean, part of the gospel message, of course, comes with like, this is the law, right? Yep. Like yep. this is yep. right in the name. Uh, but there's the gospel that comes along with it where you can look back and you could say, man, I really screwed up. You know, mm -hmm. I broke those uh, laws. I did what I know now I wasn't supposed to do. And I probably knew then. And, and I'm sorry for that. Yep. I, I desire forgiveness. I desire life, even though I have screwed up. And we have that offer of salvation that gives it to us, right? Where even though we deserve death, we deserve evil. God has offered us good. He's offered us life. It's interesting. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep this in or not. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Uh, but when God says, if you keep these commandments, then you will be fruitful and multiply and possess this land. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, when you turn your back on God and don't do what he says, then all of a sudden you're not fruitful and you're not multiplying and you're not possessing the land mm -hmm. the Lord your God has given you. Then you're always like shocked. You're like, wait, how? Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. How? Wait a minute. So we turned our back on everything God ever said and we ignored him and we thought his word was dumb and stupid and lame and boring. And then all of a sudden things were terrible. Oh, who could have predicted this? Right. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like God 100% predicted this from the beginning. And he sets before you the choice of choose life as though that's easy. Right. Like who's going to choose death? Yeah. He sets before you life and death. And who's going to be all like, well, I'm choosing death, clearly. But mm -hmm. he does want you to know that the one path is the path that leads to life. And the other one is the path that leads to death. And letting you know that if you choose to turn your back on God... You're not choosing life. Right. You're choosing the opposite. Yeah. Uh, you want to say further about that, or is it kind of cut mean, and dried? It's, it's pretty cut and dry. You know, there's life, there's death, there's good, there's bad. Yeah. That's kind of where we're at, right? Kind of where we're at. Are we doing 1 Corinthians? We absolutely are. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. As it wasn't too long ago that we had... I follow uh, Paulus, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. Right. That one, yeah. yep, that was I, quite recently. And I uh, was thinking this was the same one, but of course, similar message, different, different wording, pointing to the same fact that our human works are just a vessel that God uses, right? I wish there wasn't so much internecine squabbling between Christians. Uh, it's, it's boring and unpleasant, mm -hmm. and everybody's bummed out about it, as they should be, because it's not nice. Right. It's not nice when Christians just can't get along when they can't uh, see the bigger picture of the glory of God, mm -hmm. where they just like insist on squabbling themselves to death death. Well, and more often than not, it's the earthly things that cause the fractures, but that's, right? But that, that's the whole issue, is it's not like you gotta work on the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Like, it's, it's so simple a child can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Not difficult, not complicated, where you say, okay, so while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. And like it's a simple message of life and salvation. And the the big hang up is people guessing what it is that they need to be forgiven for. Right. And it's a lack of understanding of grace. Like when it comes down when God says to you, these are sins, 
and you say, I don't want these to be sins, okay, mm -hmm. well then what do you want to be a sin? Like, like yeah. what counts? Um, Only and, what someone else is doing. Right, always, always, always. But then like, what's the point of being a Christian if you have no sin anyway, like nothing real? If you're like, mm -hmm. ooh, I, 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 I had a beer eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I thank really you. wanted that muffin that that guy had. Yeah, okay, thanks. But like, if we're talking about like, like sin, that merits destruction and, 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 and the fact that you haven't always been choosing life, mm -hmm. that's got to mean something. And the way that these groups are splintering now is that they, by and large, you'll have people just redefining and legislating sin and saying yeah. that sin now no longer counts as sin because we say so and we don't no. want it to be sin. Because Fine. everyone's doing it, so it's not a sin anymore. You know, if you have a large enough group, then it's just okay. I'm going to try and cut in the clip of Reverend Lovejoy here from The Simpsons, where he, uh, they're talking about opening a casino in Springfield, and when they look to him for spiritual advice, he says, well, if something's legal, it's no longer a sin, and everybody goes, yay! Yeah. Once something has been approved by the government, it's no longer immoral. Yeah. Which is, I mean, like, that's where it goes, where people say if it's popular enough, it's not a sin anymore, when in reality it is. Mm -hmm. And a large part of our following of different groups and different uh, things are towards that end. It's very rarely somebody, like, this, I'm going to look at, like, the Seventh-day Adventists, for example. Okay. It's sometimes you get a group like the Seventh-day Adventists who will say it's really important to worship on the Saturday, on the Sabbath, mm -hmm. as the Jews would understand it, and we're going to make a whole separate church body to do that. All right, but it's not usually that. It's not usually something that's like actual like doctrine from no. Scripture. It's just, just like some goof around nonsense. No, for sure. Uh, let's not forget that you plant and water, but God gives the growth. Right. And and I think. A lot of what this section is dealing with is the earthly versus the heavenly, yep. where we want to put a lot more emphasis on the things that we are doing here, you know, where it's, uh, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, mm -hmm. it, I, I do this, I do that, but in that last line there, we are God's fellow workers. We're not doing this for ourselves, we're not doing this on our own, you know, it's God's field. God's building, not ours. There's a dumb quote out there that says, you can get a lot done if you don't worry so much about who gets the credit. Mm -hmm. And here you go, right? Like if you're not saying to yourself, this is my legacy, this is my yeah. work, this is my effort, but instead to say genuinely, this is about God. Um, and this is about God and his glory and his kingdom and so on and so on. And then at that point, you do end up doing things that are remarkably in, in step with what God yeah. would have you do, as opposed to the alternative, which is to say, well, God doesn't know nothing about nothing. Mm -hmm. We're here to tell God what's up. That's right. But you're, you're not. You are people, that you, you, you are the field, right? Like yeah. you're what Paul and Apollos have planted into. And even Paul and Apollos are trying to direct you over to... Towards God, yeah, not towards themselves. Like, like Luther would direct you towards God. Uh, mm -hmm. Wesley would direct you towards God, uh, like all these, like all these church fathers. Yeah, right? all these church fathers would be like desperately trying to direct you towards God. Say, like, no, 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 no. A any change that I made, I made to bring you to God. Like mm -hmm. that was the whole point. And like the ones who didn't, don't worry about that for now. But the, the ones that were serious in their convictions. They said, like, there are distractions between you and God. I'm going to try and get you back to God. And then, like, over a long period of time, people say, oh, yes. What we really should be doing is focusing on what that guy said. You're like, no, 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 no. Only insofar yeah. as that leads you to God. Only insofar as it brings you in that right direction. Otherwise, it's an impediment and ignore it. You don't have to take everything your church founder said as 100% yeah. like gospel truth. Only insofar as it clarifies and ratifies and leads you towards God. Right, and I mean, that's exactly what we see in the very beginning there, because that is a simple message, right? Mm -hmm. Focus on God. That is like the bare bones, what you need to be focusing on. And in the very beginning, it says that they are being fed with milk, not solid food, with the very basics, with what needs to be the foundation, because you can't start getting into deep theology and the differences between this and that if you can't focus on the fact that it's all about God. Good point. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, going along to Matthew 5. Let's do it. Matthew 5, 21 through 37. Anger and lust. Oh, you have heard. Oh. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders should be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole, then that your whole body be thrown to hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair black or white. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything other than that comes from evil. She whiz. There's right. no getting Wrong. around. Wrong. Yeah. Like, the, the thing that I like the most is... God? Yeah. Uh. Um, where, as humans, we are trying so hard to find the loophole, right? It's, you have the set of, of rules, they're black, they're white, and you're looking for the gray. And but he, Jesus says, there is no gray. And he's seeking to justify himself, said, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. Like, when it comes time for these questions of what is adultery, what is murder, what is, you know, okay to do with divorce and whatnot... It's always, and he's seeking to justify himself, because people very rarely ask these questions in a vacuum. No, like, there's a reason behind what they're asking. Like, more often than not, when you see, like, a celebrity get behind a charity, when they're like, I'm, I'm really into uh, Parkinson's research or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. Michael J. Fox really got into right. Parkinson's research. Well, why did he get into Parkinson's? I'm not downplaying no. his involvement or what he's done or anything like that, but I'm saying... But he has a vested interest. He has a vested interest in that. And most people, when they analyze what counts or doesn't count as sin, say that when they have a vested interest in how mm -hmm. it turns out. It's very rarely just an, like an objective, because an objective view would lead you to just this. Of course. Right? If you were to say, well, what does God say about murder? Mm -hmm. This. It's only after you've called somebody you fool that you start to say, ah, but what do you really mean by that? I don't know. Maybe yeah. things back then were different. Like, if you take this in the context, oh. in the historical context of what it meant to say you fool, that was different than when I said you fool to somebody. Right. That was way as different. As long as you can find that loophole. Well, you're looking for the loophole. All the white, time. black and white on this. Mm -hmm. Well, it's red and white. Red and white. What's, what's black and white and red all over? The newspaper. The New, the New Testament. <laughs> but, like, it's not that hard. And, like, it, the thing is, is you have to be... You, to be fair, you have to very, have a very high IQ to get this wrong. Mm. Because if you give this to a child, yep. and you say to a child, okay, small infant, small child, uh, eight-year-old, what, what do you think Jesus means about this, about adultery, about divorce, about that kind of thing, about wrath? And they'll just give you these exact words of back. Of course. Then. It's only after you have enough world experience and you've got the big brain, then you'll say, well, we can't know. No. We can't know. Who could possibly know? Who could possibly guess? If you yeah. will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you'll never enter it. And I, I do think that this is part of it. Yeah. Is like people talk about like childlike faith and childlike trust and whatnot, but genuinely, you have to just let him talk for himself. Mm -hmm. And when you don't like it, like when you kick back against it, that's the stuff you need to repent of. And that's the whole reason for the scriptures, right? Of course. The whole reason for the faith is to say, you've done wrong, you need to be forgiven. But most people just want to say, okay, I don't like where it points out what I've done wrong, so I'm going to pretend those aren't sins. Well, then why are you a Christian then? Yeah. And like a lot of people aren't Christians anymore because 
the church went to such great effort to tell them, you haven't done anything wrong. Right. And then they said, well, then why do I got to go to church? And the church did not have a good reason for it. They're like, well, we're going to preach salvation. Well, what do I got to need to be saved mm -hmm. from? Well, that's part of where I think we as society fall short is that we try so hard to remove any kind of shame that we're not willing to examine ourselves. We're not willing to look and see where we have fallen short and where we can improve. We're just being told you're fine how you are. And if you believe you're fine how you are, why are you going to change anything? Why are you going to bring a single microsecond of repentance to God? You, you're not. You're, you're not. There's nothing to repent for. No, you, you, you've done nothing wrong. You've sinned not at all. At, at no point do you have anything that you would go to God and say, yeah, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. You are just 100% comfy time mm -hmm. living in a world where God answers to you. Right. But that's why, are, why are you going to go to the scriptures that tell you you've done wrong, done wrong when you can go to your church that tells you that you're fine how you are? My advice to anybody always, and like what I would say makes the Lutheran church different than any other church anywhere, really, is that you can read out of any passage of scripture and just have it be affirmed mm. and say, yep, that's right. Even if you don't like it, it's still like right. It, right? Like, that's not the point. Do you like it or not? I, I can understand many of you watching at home are not going to like it. You're not mm -hmm. going to like what it says about adultery or murder or divorce or anything or retaliation or anything like that. You're not going to like it. It's not the point. The point is not do you like it or not. The point is that, like, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell you why you need him. And deep yeah. down, you know this is true, right? Because you know it's true about other people. You know for sure it's true about other people. Um, you, you know for sure that when people are, are like mean to you and, and when they cheat you out of things and when they mm -hmm. retaliate against you, it's not nice. Uh, and you would say that those people would need to repent. Well, like, so do you, you donkey. And like, that's the only difference. I use the donkey in the Lutheran sense that we're a stubborn and recalcitrant yeah. donkey. Yeah, that just was funny to have in the midst of yeah, right. conversation. Well, Luther knows what's up. Um, it is just there to remind you of your need for grace, right? Mm -hmm. And every time you kick back against this, you are denigrating the work that Christ does to forgive you because he's trying to take these sins away from you yeah. and you insist on holding them. Right, because if you can't admit it's a sin, you can't give it to Christ. Right, so just let it go. Like when, when he tells you, he's try, like when he says, like people like the pastors where he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy my burden mm -hmm. is light I'm like yeah what a great thing he's trying to take your burden you have to let go of it first yeah, but he's really like in these yeah. pastors he's telling you what he wants to take yeah he's saying to you okay you didn't do these things right i would like to take mm -hmm. them from you now please you may suffer no consequences and if you're being such a donkey that you're going to say no i want to keep it like i want to keep these things mm -hmm. I, I i want to let you have nothing yeah What's he, what, what can he do? It reminds me of a small child where they have something that they are incredibly attached to. Like for our household, it's like a, a too small pair of pants or something, yeah. right? Where it's just, but I like these pants. They're ripped. They don't fit well, but still refusing to let go of them until the point where you can say, right, but look at these. These are new. They fit you. They are infinitely better than what you're holding on to. Let me switch you. Let me take the old, busted, broken, ill-fitting thing that you have and replace it with something that is better for you, that is new, that is nice. Just let me do that. Yeah. Like he's like, and, and we, like, we, we have this like, stupid, dumb, black and white thinking where we say, if I admit that I've done wrong, then I'm a bad person. No, like the way you work it is you say, I'm a bad person who does things that are wrong, but I can be redeemed. Yeah. Very simple. But if you don't believe that you are sinful and unclean by nature, then you won't believe that anything you've actually done is wrong. And then you end up in the situation where you refuse to give God the pants. Yeah. And it's, he, why are you holding on to this? It's to your detriment. Yeah. Why are you, why are you accumulating garbage like a dung beetle? You don't need to. You really don't need to. Well, that's part of why I love the theology of saint and sinner, that you're simultaneously both. Yeah. Just because you admit that you've done wrong doesn't mean that you are only a sinner. You are a sinner. 
you have done wrong, you need forgiveness. And that's where the saint comes in, yeah. where you've been redeemed by God. You've been forgiven. You still are a sinner. You still sin. You still do wrong. But you have been forgiven and your sins are washed clean. And it, and it should be just fine if somebody says to you, you know, you broke these rules of the Bible. You're like, yeah, I know. Isn't it great that Christ forgives? Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, well, I don't break any rules of the Bible. Good luck. Yeah, good there's, luck with that. there's 10 million of them. You've broken one. Yeah, and, and good luck trying to justify that before the world that is looking for you to fail. Yeah. 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 The Bible's great. I mean, it always is and always has been. And it's, it's even better if you let it work on its own terms. Instead of trying to make it fit what you want. Yeah, instead of, instead of going to absolute crazy lengths yeah. to try, try and make it say whatever you want to say, you're always going to look like a bit of a dope. Mm -hmm. uh, because it does, there are multiple passages that contradict what you want to do. Yeah. Like, it's not like a one-off where there's like this one tiny, like, even the commandments about, like, eating pork and shellfish or whatever are repeated. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like you can say, well, back then things were just different. Like, if, if it's that different, then why do they go to such great lengths to set these commandments before you and say, choose mm -hmm. life or death? And then they give you these commandments multiple times, and there you are trying to snake around them. Stop. You don't mm -hmm. need to. Mm -hmm. Just let, let Christ forgive you, man. Let, let Christ's grace into your heart, and, and don't, don't slap his forgiveness away. In, in many ways, when, the, when Jesus says to his disciples, I have to go and suffer and die, and they say, never, Lord, never let this happen to you. In effect, we're doing the same thing now, yeah. but instead of saying, I don't want you to die, we're saying, I don't want you to die for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's wrap there, shall let's we? Let's do it. All right. Gracious Lord, in your grace, uh, you came to earth to live and die to forgive sins, and we ask you to help us by softening our hearts that we might give those sins to you as much as we don't want to. Because we don't want to, because that means that we admit that we are frail and flawed and, and we have problems. But you already know that. You know it is in the heart of men. So soften our hearts. Uh, help us to read your word and to understand that these are things that you do for us for a very good reason. You want to take these sins as far as the East is from the West. So help our hearts be softened towards your law. Help us to see your grace and help us to trust your grace and we admit all these flaws, frailties, weaknesses, and send those burdens over to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your time today. Uh, we'll catch you later. We'll see you sometime.